Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios in beautiful, sunny, warm downtown Bolivar, West Virginia. I'm Phil Bernberg, and today we're going to be continuing the discussion from the previous part where we're talking about an introduction to glaze testing. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And what we did last time, we took a glaze recipe, a base glaze recipe, and we, with, it was a fairly simple recipe. I purposely picked one that had four ingredients. And what we did was we said, what would happen if in turn, we doubled each one of the ingredients and kept the proportion of the other ingredients the same? And the idea would be, that way we could see what happens when we make that change and that therefore we can learn what is that what does that ingredient contribute to the glaze or how does that ingredient affect the glaze when we do that so that was the purpose of it so we what we did was we 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 with these four ingredients epk frit 3124 elastonite and silica first we made a batch where we doubled the epk then we made a batch where we doubled the the, amount, the percentage of 3124 then we made a batch where we doubled the elastonite, and then we doubled the silica. So we had five batches that we made all together that we were comparing. We had the original recipe, and then we had the other four where we had doubled each one of the ones. So what, we, what, we're, gonna, what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna continue. We, we, talk, we wanna talk about, okay, once we had done that, um, we wanna say, how could, you con how could you logically continue this experiment or how, this, this testing? So these are some ways that you could, do, that you could continue it. First of all, with the double EPK, now, and this, is, this will also re refresh your memory as far as how they came out. But when we added the double EPK to the recipe, basically it changed the recipe from sort of a clear, slightly satiny glaze. It was completely opaque and white. So what you could do if you wanted to continue that, you could say, well, okay, I'm just gonna add some colorants to it and see now how, how the colorants are affected by the fact that this is now an opaque white glaze. Or another path could be, I could add more glass to make it less matte. When I added all that, that, all the EPK to it, all the clay, it completely matted out the glaze. So I could say, well, what would happen first if I tried to bring it back to sort of overcome the effect of all the EPK and make it more glassy? So I could do that, for instance, by adding more ferrofrit 3124, and then I could add the colorants to it. We're gonna do the first one, though. We're gonna just add colorants to it to see what the effect is. And then for the double, for the double 3124, this was where I add, I doubled the frit. Basically that came out clear and glossy and fairly run, and a little runny because again, 3124 is a fairly low melting frit. And so when I doubled it, it basically sort of lowered the overall melting point of the glaze. The glaze became a little runnier, um, but, it, but, it was, but it was still clear and glossy. So if I wanted to continue from there, I could add opacifiers to it and see what would happen and see and make it more opaque and then I could add colorants to it. Or because it was a little runny, I could add clay to it, add the, a, little more, a little more stabilizer and then I could add opacifiers and then I could add colorants. So these are possible paths. What we're gonna do in this case is we're gonna, we're gonna go directly to adding um, either opacifiers or colorants. For the, for the double Wollastonite batch, and, and I, we saved the batches from last time so that we could continue with this, with this testing. We could either add colorants to it or we could add opacifiers to make it more opaque and then add colorants. These are just suggestions for possible steps that you could explore if you, know, if you were interested. And then finally, for the double silica batch, which came out clear and glossy, it was kind of stiff um, because there was probably some undissolved silica in it. But we could add more. We could add more. We could add opacifiers to make it more opaque, and then add colorants. Or we could add more glass and flux to make it make it to balance out the extra silica that we added. And then we could add colorants. In this case, we're going to add colorants. We're going to add colorants to it. So, um, so we're going to basically what what I what I decided to do for this testing is we'll take the previous batches where we had doubled the percentages of each of the ingredients and we're going to add either either a colorant or an opacifier to it and make certain comparisons. So for for instance for the for the double EPK batch we're going to add cobalt carbonate 
in two different percentage levels. And the way we're going to do this is, we'll, we already have the, the fired samples from the double EPK batch. Well, what we'll do is we'll make an addition to that batch of a certain percentage. In this case, for instance, for the 300 gram batch that I made, we'll add three tenths of a gram of cobalt carbonate, and then we'll dip a sample into it. And then we'll make another addition to that same batch, mix it up, and then we'll take another sample from that. So we'll, we can use the same, with the same sample or the same batch and continue and make continuous additions to it and then see the, the, the changes that we get. So we're gonna, so we'll add cobalt carbonate, uh, three tenths of a gram, which will give us basically on the percentage basis, that would be a tenth of a percent cobalt carbonate. And then we'll, we'll take a sample, and then we'll, we'll add more cobalt carbonate, we'll add another 2.7 grams, which will, bring the total at, which, is, which will bring the total up to basically 9 tenths of a percent, or 1% total cobalt carbonate. That's a lot of cobalt carbonate. As you're probably familiar, cobalt carbonate, cobalt is a very powerful colorant. So this is a lot of cobalt that we're ending up in the second batch. Even, even a tenth of a gram or a tenth of a percent is a lot of cobalt. So then for the 3124 batch, we're going to add an opacifier. And the reason why I decided to do that was the fact that the 3124 was, was a little more low melting and a little more fluid because of the extra, the extra frit. And when you add a lot of opacifier, it tends to actually stiffen the glaze because you have these particles that are floating around in the glaze. and They actually tend to make the glaze a little less fluid. So I thought that because the glaze already was fluid from the extra flux, it would tolerate the addition of a lot of Zircopax. So we're going to add, we're going to start off with a 3% addition of Zircopax. And, that, and for our batch that we made, it was 300 grams. So we're adding nine, nine grams. And then we're going to increase that to a total of 10% Zircopax, which is a lot of Zircopax. And we'll see the effect on, on, the, on that glaze. The next one was the double velastinite. And in this case, I'm this is where I'm going to add, I wanted to add a color. The, the double velastinite, we got a fair amount of crystallization to it when it, when it cooled down. It was nice and, and sort of satiny matte. So we're going to add 1%, we're going to have 1% of a mason stain, and then we'll increase that to a total of 3% of a mason stain. Okay. And one thing, one of the comparisons I'm making here, there are two different ways you can make a, you can add a color into a glaze. There are what are called suspension glazes, sus suspension colorants, and solution colorants. And what that means is a suspension colorant is a, colored, is a colored powder or a colored particle that you put into the glaze, and it basically just floats around in the glaze, and whatever color those particles are, that's the color that you get with the glaze, because they, they, they don't, the particles don't change, they're just floating around in the glaze. A solution colorant the particles are actually dissolving in the glaze. They're actually dissolving in the glass. And so they change the way, that the, they change the color of the glass completely, not because they're individual particles floating around, but the whole color of the glass changes. And there are differences in the intensities, as you'll see, between a suspension colorant and a solution colorant. So that's one of the things we're gonna be looking at. So this is a suspension colorant. The mason stain is just, in this case, it's a green mason stain. They're just going to be little green particles that are floating around in the glaze, and we'll see how those levels affect the color of the glaze. And then finally, for the double silica, again, I, because this glaze was already a little on the stiff side from having the extra silica, for instance, I didn't want to try adding a lot of, let's say, Zircopax to it, because that would stiffen the glaze even more, and it actually would change the appearance of the glaze. So I was trying not to change the texture of the glaze, just the color or the appearance of the glaze without actually making it you know, more matte or less matte, that sort of thing. So in this case, we're going to add copper carbonate to a 1% level, and then we'll also increase it to a 3% level. So I've got the same percentages of copper carbonate that I have of the mason stain, only the mason stain is a suspension colorant, and the copper carbonate is a solution colorant. So we'll be able to compare the effects. Okay, so as I mentioned before, what we did was we'd, 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 make out, we'd weigh out an addition and add it to the glaze batch and stir it up and mix it thoroughly, and then we'd dip a test sample in, of it, in it and, then, and then remove it, and then we'd weigh out the second addition and add it to the batch and mix it up thoroughly and then dip a sample into that. I should note that this procedure does not give the exact percentages 
that we're, we're, we're talking about when I say one in three percent, because when you think about it, when I dip a sample in, I'm removing some material. So I'm sort of assuming that, that I'm, I'm pretending that I'm not removing any material when I'm dipping the sample in, because otherwise I'd have to weigh the amount of material that the sample is removing and sort of do a little recalculation there. But it, the point is, it's close enough. And if I, get, if I get a result from this test that gives me something that I like, I can always go back then and make that batch up exactly and not have to worry about the fact that I've removed something. So this is kind of a first run through, but it's, it's definitely close enough to give you an idea about what's happening. So we did this, and then we fired the samples all at cone six. And so I wanted to talk a little bit, I, I, just to mention again, why I, to summarize before we look at them, why I selected these particular examples. The EP, when we added the, the extra EPK to the formula, it completely matted out the sample. So what I wanted to see was by adding even a really strong colorant, how much would that colorant be affected by the fact that the glaze was made now completely opaque and completely matted out? How would it change the behavior of this colorant that we normally know is a fairly strong colorant? And as I mentioned with the 3124, because the glaze is fairly fluid, I figured it could accept a fair amount of zircopax without changing it. That was the reason. So I thought that would be a good one to try that. And then the, the, the extra silica and the extra elastinite, I really wanted to compare the, 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 the two. They're both, they, they looked about the same after they were fired in the sense that they were, they were matte or slightly matte and they were, they were cl partially clear. So I wanted to see the effect of the different types of colorants. So let's, talk, let's look a little bit at the samples now after we fired them and see what we got. So this first, the first row here on the left, this is, this is the, uh, with the double EPK. And this first example here on the left is this is with the small percentage, the tenth of a percent of cobalt carbonate. And as you can see, it's barely blue. It's almost like a very, very, very pale blue. And then this, this, this second half is where we went up to 1% cobalt carbonate. And this sample down below it is, is an entire sample of 1% cobalt carbonate. So this side is, is a tenth of a percent, and this is, this is 1%. And as you can see, it's still a very gray, gray blue. So the effect of having all the extra EPK in there was it really muted the color. And this is, the, this is a fairly common effect of opaque glazes, where you have a lot of something in them, like, like extra EPK or even a lot of zircopax. It tends to mute the colors. So this is a good example. Normally, this would have been a brilliant dark blue, darker even than this, than, well, you can't see it in this tape on the edge of the, the sample holder, but it would be a really brilliant dark blue. And in this case, it's, it's almost, it's barely, barely blue. It's almost just kind of a gray. That's the effect of all the Zerk, of all the, the EPK. Okay, the second one was this is the double 3124 where we added the Zercopax to it. And so we had 3% Zercopax and, and, and we had, or 3% and then 10%. You, can, you can't see it very well in this case because it's a white clay, but the, the, with the 3% Zercopax, it only came out sort of translucent. It didn't completely make the glaze opaque. When we went 10% on this side and also this whole sample down here, it made the glaze completely opaque. It didn't change the, because the glaze was already glossy and it had a lot of flux in it, it didn't change really the appearance of the surface texture of the glaze, but with the 10%, it completely matted it out, okay? So this, would, this glaze, just as I mentioned before, when, before we added this, this would be a perfectly usable glaze, only in that case, it's completely opaque white. Okay, and the next, the next sample where we added the double wollastonite, this is now, this is, a, this is a suspension colorant. So we had 1% of the mason stain and we had 3% of the mason stain. And the 1%, again, was kind of translucent. It, this is, this, on this particular side, it, it, when it was thin, you can, you, it, you can still see through it. You can see that it's strongly green, but it's translucent. Now when I added a total of 3%, it actually made the glaze completely opaque. So it, yes, it, it's a, it, 3% was a very strong color, but it also completely opacified the glaze. And this is because when you think about it again, if this is a suspension colorant, you have all these little particles floating around in the glaze. So they're not just coloring the glass green, they're actually blocking the light the same way that the Zircopax did. So that's not, this is not a surprising result, the fact that when I added that much of a suspension colorant, it actually made the glaze opaque. It didn't just make it green. 
And finally, with the double silica, we had, we had the same proportions. We had one and three. But if you look at the difference, 1% of the copper carbonate is a much paler green than the 1% of the, of the mason stain. And the same way, even 3% of the, the, the copper carbonate is a paler green than the mason stain. And it also is, it's still transparent. So even though it's hard to see here, but this is still basically a transparent green, whereas this is an opaque green. So you can see the difference between, between the effect, and the, yet they're the same percentage levels. The difference in strength between the, uh, the suspension colorant and the solution colorant. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. We have five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. The first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a bisque level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop. Um, looks like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. And again, you get all the previous benefits. You also get a handmade uh, Potter's Roundtable mug. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Okay, so I guess some observations then sort of summarizing what we've done here. Basically, the additives that we put into the glaze didn't really noticeably affect the way the glaze is melted or the surface textures. They really just affected whether the, glaze were, was, the glazes were opaque or whether they were uh, on this, and the colorant. And, the, and the, another important conclusion was that the normal strong color of the cobalt was severely muted by the presence of all the EPK. The fact that I had all those powders in there and the fact that the glaze was no longer transparent, I really muted the effect of the strong, co normally strong cobalt colorant. Um, and at the same percentages, we, we just me mentioned this, the, the, the stain made the glaze opaque, whereas the copper carbonate, which is also going to give a green color, but it didn't make the glaze opaque. So I guess what I'd like to do at this point is, is conclude with a couple of more, with, with just some, some more basic glaze information, some recommendations for tests for continued glaze testing. So first of all, Let's talk about like reading this, and this is just sort of dropping back to sort of more general procedures or information for, for, for glaze testing. So let's talk about like reading glaze recipes. So first of all, if you look, if you just look at a glaze recipe, it's useful with some practice to just be able to look at the recipe and be able to decide what are those, in, when I look at the recipe, what are those ingredients doing in the recipe? So if I look at a glaze recipe and I see either that it contains a frit or any chemical that's, that contains either lithium, sodium, and potassium, for instance, such as potassium feldspar, or anything such that contains magnesium, calcium, barium, or strontium, like barium carbonate or magnesium oxide, or zinc, like zinc oxide, or Gersley borate, these are all primarily fluxes. So when I look at a recipe and I see those ingredients, I can say that, okay, th their main contribution to the, to the functioning of the glaze is as a flux. When I see silica or the word silica or flint, that's the glass former. And flint is just another term. It's the same thing as flint, as silica. It's just, it's a, it's a rock name basically for a form of silica. So that would be the glass formers. 
Finally, when I look at at the, when, if I look at the next ingredients, if I look at clay, I might see EPK, which is Edgar Plastic Kaolin, or I might see kaolin, or I might see ball clay in the recipe. Those are all basically the stabilizers in the recipe. That's, that's what's providing the aluminum oxide, and their primary function is stabilizers. But they also act as suspenders in the bucket, so that when I have a clay ingredient in a glaze, all of those clays or any of those clays are helping to keep the materials in suspension in the wet glaze. And finally, I might see things such as ingredients such as zircopax or tin oxides. Those are primarily opacifiers. We, we use zircopax in this exercise that we did here. Tin oxide is another opacifier. They both give basically a white appearance to the glaze. So that, and they're not part of the basic, the base glaze recipe. They're an additive to the glaze, the modifier to the glaze. Okay, converting another 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 subject here. Let's talk a little bit about converting recipe in in parts to weight percent. You might see a recipe that's given in parts. So here's an example. This is for a cone ten celadon, and so we have the ingredients: potash, feldspar, whiting, EPK, flint, and red iron oxide. And this is the way the recipe was written, just in in these parts: twenty seven eighty. I'm assuming they were grams, but it it doesn't it didn't say. And the sum of the parts was 10,275. So suppose I wanted to actually, and as I mentioned before, it's much better to have a recipe in true weight percent because then it's easier to compare one, one recipe to another. And it's actually easier to make up the glaze recipe, as you'll see. But if I, so if I wanted to convert this recipe to, to weight percent, this is how you'd do it. I'd take each one of the parts and divide it by the sum of the parts. So I take, for instance, the potash feldspar, which had 2,780 parts, and I divide it by 10,275. That gives me a decimal fraction, 0 0.2706. Well, that decimal fraction is basically the same thing as 27.06%, or I rounded it up to 27.1%, 27.1%, okay? So, so if I did that, that so now I can now the recipe is potash feldspar 27.1, whiting 19.5, and so forth, and red iron oxide one. So now I have the recipe in, in a true weight percent formula. However, it's still, if we go on to, continue to the next for the best for the best recipe format, if I still want to, if I if it's actually, as we've mentioned before, the red iron oxide, for instance, for this example, is really not part of the base glaze recipe. So it's really still a better procedure to show the recipe for the base glaze and then have the additives on top of that or separate. So in this case, if I take the, if I take the, the previous way I had the, the, the recipe, I really should pull out the red iron oxide. So in this case, I have the, the, the same parts as last time, potash feldspar 2780, but what I've, and, but now what I've done is I've moved the iron oxide to the bottom under this section that we're calling additives here. So the sum of the parts above it is now a little smaller. It's now 10,175. So I do the same thing. I divide each one of the parts, for instance, 2780, by the sum of those parts, 10,175, and I get the decimal fraction, 0.2732, which is the same as 27.3%. And now when I, and I do that for all those, for the other four ingredients. Now when I come down to the additives, I had the 100, the 100 parts of iron oxide, and I divide it by the total that I got above 10,175, and it gives me a 1% addition. And this is the, so, so now if you look on the right side of this, this slide, this is the way, that, this is the better preferred way to write the recipe. So the potash feldspar would be 27.3, 19.7, plus, you'd say the additives are plus, Red iron oxide, 1.0%. This, this is sort of a, a nice universal way to write a recipe. And it makes it easier to compare them because when you're looking at the glaze, what you really care about is what's, how does the base glaze function? How does it melt? Is it satin or matte? Or, you know, what are the properties? And without the modifiers in it, that's really one, one of the things you're interested in. Now, suppose I want to calculate... And this is this this is an easy way to if I want to calculate the size of a recipe of a batch of, of, that I want to make up, calculating the weights for a for batch. If I have the formula that I just that I had I just did here with the with the, with the additives at the bottom, if I if I use the decimal fraction version of those percentages, so 27.3 is just 0.273. And let's say I want to make up a 500 gram batch, so it's easy. I just multiply the 500 gram bat the 500 grams 
times each of the decimal fractions for the ingredients. So 500 grams times 0.273 says I need 136.6 grams for this 500 gram batch. All the way down, and I keep doing that, and all the way down to the bottom, I take the 500 gram batch times 0.01, which is 1%, and it tells me I need five grams of, of iron oxide. So this, this is one reason why I like, this is one reason why I like um, to do the, the recipe in this format. It's easy to compare them, but it's also, it's very easy. I can just multiply that decimal fraction by whatever my batch size is to get the quantity I need to make that up. And I, but anyway, so now, so the next thing would be, would be if I wanted to, if I had the batch, the, 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 the batch, the glaze batch in the parts, there is a way I can use the, I can use the parts recipe without, if I, if I don't want to bother converting it to the percent, there is a way I can still use that to, to figure out the weights that I need. Um, we go. Okay, so if the recipe is given in parts, I can either convert it to weight percent the way I just talked about, or I can use a proportion formula. So here's my, here's my recipe again, back in the original format with just these parts, summing up to 10,275. And so what I do is I make a proportion between the size of the batch that I want and the, and the size of the total of the parts. So if I wanna make up a 500 gram batch and the total of this, this original recipe is 10,275, I make the fraction of 500 over 2,075, which is 0.0487, and then I multiply each of the parts by that fraction. So point, because so, what I'm saying is basically, these are the parts I need for this big batch, so I only need a smaller fraction of those, of those ingredients for a smaller batch. And I, and I use the, the proportion, the, 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 relate, the ratio of the two to do that. So I would say, I would say, I would take 2780 times the, the, the fraction of 500 over 10,275, and that gives me 135.3. So I can do that. But it still is leaving the recipe in the in the parts, and I still think it's much more useful to have um, the, the the glaze the recipe in the formation in the form of percentage rather than parts. But this is the way you can get around it. If you have a recipe in parts, you can get around that and and do that. Okay, so just some some general recommendations now that I thought I'd like to make for for glaze testing. First of all, if you're if you're you know, and we mentioned that there are a lot of different reasons to do glaze testing. I mean, in this case. The purpose of this test that we went through was really to, to, to sort of try to understand, to look at a, at a glaze recipe and understand what is the effect or what is each one of these ingredients doing? And therefore, if I increase it a lot, what will the effect be on that glaze? That's, that's one thing you can do. But you, for instance, you might, there are, there are a number of other reasons that you might want to do glaze testing. For instance, you might want to, you might just see a glaze recipe and you might just want to evaluate it using your ingredients. But your source for, for ingredients is, might be different than somebody else's. Maybe you're using, for instance, a different kind of potash feldspar. So if the recipe calls for potash feldspar, using your ingredients might give a different result than somebody else using their ingredients. So another reason for glaze testing might simply be just to, to see what kind of a result do you get with your ingredients, the ones that you have available. It's not necessarily going to be the same as what's in a book or in a publication. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another example might be to test a substitute ingredient. Let's say you found a recipe that calls for a certain kind of, again, potash feldspar, which is no longer exists. You can't get it. So now you have to substitute a different kind of potash feldspar. And so you might want to just see, well, am I still going to get the effect, the reported or the, the, the pictured effect for that glaze? with this different ingredient. So the purpose could be in that case, I'm testing a substitute ingredient. Um, or you might wanna understand the functions of an ingredient, which is really what we were doing here. Um, you also might wanna change the property of an ingredient, of, 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 of a recipe. For instance, what's the firing temperature? Maybe you wanna change that. We just talked, we just had a question about that, about lowering, making the glaze melt at a lower temperature. So there's another, a different reason to do a, a series of glaze tests small additions to find out what's the appropriate addition to make it melt or fuse at a lower temperature. You might wanna do a testing, for instance, to solve a problem like runniness. You have a glaze that you really like, but at your firing temperature that you don't wanna change, the glaze is runny. So you might wanna do a series of tests to solve that problem. How can I make the glaze less runny? Or how can I solve a crazing problem or a shivering problem? Um, maybe you wanna make, maybe you wanna create a totally new glaze recipe. Maybe you just sort of want to explore and say, well, what happens if I put these things together? Can I make a glaze out of them? 
And this might even involve using a new ingredient. For instance, you might have a clay or something, a material that's locally available. Maybe you live near a quarry that, that quarries you know, limestone or some other material. You might say, I wonder if I can use this material to make a glaze. So that would be a different kind of glaze testing. So what I suggest, though, is when you're doing this is start out with a simple recipe. Don't, don't start out with a recipe that has 15 ingredients. Keep it, keep it as simple as you can. And if, if, if there are a lot of glazes that have four ingredients or even fewer. So it just makes it easier to keep track of it. The other thing just to mention also is when you're doing this, you don't need three decimal points in terms of the percentages. I've seen recipes that would be like 27.314%. That's completely unnecessary. In most cases, you could probably even, for the main, for the base glaze, you could probably even round off the numbers just to the whole percentage. I never go more than a tenth of a percent. So I might say like 27.1%, but I would never go 27.14765%. And you could probably just call it 27%. You know, keep it simple. That's close enough. Um, I'd say another thing that's, that's important, especially when you're making up small test things, is mix the ingredients really well and sieve them as necessary. And this is especially important for colorants because if you're making up a small test batch, you're going to have an even smaller quantity of a colorant. And so you want to make sure that that color is really well distributed and really well mixed in that small sample, or you're not going to get you know, a really representation of the way it's going to come out. There are certain other ingredients that are also just difficult to mix, like bentonite, as, as you're probably aware. When you mix it with water, it becomes sort of sticky glue-like material. So again, you want to make sure that the bentonite, is, if you have it in the recipe, is really well mixed and really well distributed so that you don't end up with lumps of bentonite in your glaze. And there are, there, are, there are several other ingredients that are sort of tricky to work with. Tin oxide can be kind of lumpy. So that if you don't, if you don't screen the material really carefully, mix it thoroughly, you're going to end up with white lumps of tin oxide. Um, uh, so, and there, there are several like that that tend to be kind of lumpy when you do that. Cornwall stone is another one that can be kind of lumpy and hard to break up. So it takes a little extra care to get them distributed in the glaze. I usually recommend a minimum batch size of, a, of 100 grams, and 200 grams is better. I'm trying, if I'm making up a lot of tests, I don't want to waste a lot of materials, but I want a, enough of a sample that I can, I can easily weigh it out and enough that I can maybe get a couple of tests out of it. So I found 200 grams is generally a pretty good uh, quantity. For this experiment that we just talked about, we did 300 because I wanted enough, this was done as part of a workshop here at Washington Street Studios. So we had, I wanted to make enough material where several people could, for instance, dip their samples in after we made an addition and then make another addition, and then and then make a and then dip some more samples. So I want to make sure that we we had enough material to do that. But 200 grams is usually a good amount. The other thing I would mention is keep good records. Um, keep good records of your testing because I've got records going back 20 years, and I can go back and pull out a glaze sample, and I can see what I did for it. And one of the things I suggest is for this for the record keeping is figure out some kind of a numbering or identification system that's unique. And one of the systems I do is, I, I keep all my notes from my pottery, I keep in a notebook like this. So everything, everything I do, sketches and everything else goes in my notebook. And so the way, the way that I, I identify my glazes on my tests, I number the notebook number. This happens to be notebook number 14. And then I number all the pages. And then I number the sample on the page. So, the only, so when I have a number like 1435-2, that's book 14, page 35, sample number 2. And that's a unique sample. So I only have to put that number on a sample, and I know, ex and I can go back to my notebook, find the page, and know exactly what it is. Well, you don't have to use that, but I'd say find something. Don't just put A, B, C, and one, two, three, because if you save your samples, and then you go back a year from now, and you go, oh, I remember I made a great blue glaze, and I've got a perfect pot now. I want to put that blue. I want to make up that blue glaze and put it on it. And you go back, and you have 15 glazes that are number two. You'll never be able to find it. So figure out something unique. So keep good records and see if you can come up with some kind of a unique, doesn't, whatever works for you, but some kind of a unique numbering system that as you go on and you accumulate records, they're not going to duplicate so that everyone is unique. Um, also, test your, your glazes on samples that are similar to your work. So whatever your clay body is, make up test samples out of that particular clay body. Don't use some other, you know, like this, you have a, an, an old scrap bag of clay and you think, oh, that'll be good, I'll make test samples, but you're never going to make work out of that clay because the clay can have a big effect on the appearance of the glaze, not just in terms of if it's a colored clay with the color showing through the glaze and modifying the color, but it can have a big effect on just the overall appearance. So use it on, and, and 
in addition to the clay body, try to, try to produce even the thickness of the clay can have an effect on it. And the glaze thickness can have an effect. So when you're testing, try to test it under the same conditions that you would as if you were putting it on a piece of your work. I, I mentioned before, it's a good idea, if, you have, if you're not sure about what's going to happen, is use some kind of a catch pan or a cookie or a slab or something under the glazes. We had an example here in our studio just recently that I hadn't run into before. Two of our studio glazes, which by themselves are very stable and don't run, and, and a, we did a, somebody did a, a, a case where they made a couple of pieces and they overlapped the glazes and they ran like crazy. And I had never run, in this, run into this before on these particular two glazes. But all of a sudden now that the two normally stable glazes overlap and they ran like crazy. So, and I, I didn't even think about the fact that we would need some kind of catch system underneath them because I already knew they were stable glazes, except when you combine them. Because when you think about it, if I combine or I overlap two glazes, in a sense, I've made a third glaze. I've made a new glaze because they combine differently so that it's not the same. And finally, when you're firing, use cones. Fire, you should be firing in your glazes by looking at the cones, not looking at the temperature, okay? Also, don't fire too fast. We've mentioned this before in some of the other discussions that when you fire with a fast firing schedule, the final temperature, if you, let's say you fired to cone six and cone six goes down and you go, ah, I'm done. But when you fire faster, the temperature when the cone six goes down is actually higher than if you fire slowly, more slowly. And, and that, it might be higher by 20, 25, 30 degrees. That's enough for some glazes to affect, you know, whether they're runny or not, especially in the cone six range or the earthenware range. So don't, don't do a, especially for testing where you're trying to evaluate a glaze, don't do a fast firing, do a slow or at least a medium firing. And also just be aware of the fact that the cooling rate can also affect the appearance of a glaze. So you might see a picture of a pod or a, or a recipe or a description of a glaze, and it might, tell you something about the appearance of the glaze, the cooling rate can have a big effect on the, on, the, on the glaze. When you cool more slowly, if a glaze has a tendency to crystallize, the glaze will be more matte and you'll get certain color effects by the formation of the, of the micro, the little tiny crystals in the glaze, and that can affect the overall appearance. And so if, you, if your kiln cools more rapidly by itself, then you're not gonna get some of those crystallization effects. And they don't always, when they, when they talk about the glaze or you see a glaze recipe, I, from what I've seen, it's very unusual for someone to give you the firing conditions necessarily, especially the cooling conditions. So be aware of that. If, the, if, the re, if you do a glaze test and it doesn't come out exactly like the recipe, one possible source of that difference could be the rate at which they, the glaze cooled. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time, so if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. If you enjoyed the presentation, please like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends and other potters. This helps our videos get found. Um, if you didn't like it, tell us why. We're, in, we're always interested to know, you know what we can do to improve our presentations. Also, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. Um, so I guess we'd like to thank you for visiting with us today, and thank you for, for, for watching us. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website, at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.